his messenger and struggling in their path, فَتَرَبَّصُوا You just wait then. حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ Until Allah comes with his command, with his decision. You just wait. Allah issues a threat. And then the biggest, the biggest curse of Allah in that ayah is, وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ It is Allah who will not guide. He will not guide the corrupt nation. He calls these people the corrupt, who love this more than Allah. Here he says about the kuffar, you love money. تُحِبُّونَ الْمَالِ حُبًّا جَمَّا جَمْ in Arabic يَدُلُّ عَلَى الْكَثْرَ More specifically, to, uh, uh, جَمْ in Arabic is used when you have a, uh, like a ruler or a scale and you fill it up all the way as far as the scale goes. Right? Beyond the scale, you're just filled to the brim that's called, right? So you love wealth as it's filled to the brim. It has to be like fully, fully, fully loaded. It has to be that kind of wealth. That's what you're in love with. وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا now, this was, the human being has those psychological problems. He says, my Lord has honored me, my Lord has humiliated me. It went from there straight to pointing at the Quraysh. Tuhibbun, tahaddun, ta'kulun. Right? These are words talking straight to the Quraysh. But then now again the surah moves in its conclusion as the previous surah moved towards the Akhirah. The, su- the previous surah, interestingly, had the Akhirah in the beginning. al ghashiyah Right? In the beginning there was mention of the hereafter. Now we're coming at the end. In the previous surah, we, we read, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْغَاشِيَةِ And now we're going to read, كَلَّا إِذَا دُكَّتِ الْأَرْضُ دَكَّنْ دَكَّ When the earth is smashed and pounded. Dakka, okay, is to pound, literally to pound and beat until whatever material it is turns to powder and crust. And then you, you can flatten it out. Allah says, Dakkan Dakka, meaning over and over the earth is going to be pounded and pounded and pounded until it turns into nothing but like powder. And it's just spread, just flattened out completely. You know, in the previous surah, Allah it made us reflect on how the earth is so vast and the, the, the mountains are so strong, such strong pegs on the earth, right? So, وَإِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَيْفَ سُطِحَتْ وَإِلَى الْجِبَالِ كَيْفَ نُصِبَتْ And now in the surah, he's taking that same earth and he's destroying it. He's completely destroying it. He says, إِذَا دُكَّتِ الْأَرْضُ دَكَّنْ دَكَّ Now, in the previous ayat, there was all this talk about wealth. Wealth where? On the earth. And you should know, all that you've saved, wherever you've saved it, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be crushed, reduced to nothing and flattened. Actually, this is the same word used with Musa alayhi salam. فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّى رَبُّهُ لِلْجَمَلْ جَعَلَهُ دَكَّةً Now anyway, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا 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 When, and your Lord will descend, and the angels will descend, rows upon rows upon rows, صَفًّا صَفًّا Over and over again, rows upon rows of angels are going to keep descending. It will seem like this never-ending army. Now, previously, Again, understand, they were, they were impressed with their power on the earth. Allah is showing them how He's going to show them His power from the sky. How the, 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 angel, the armies of angels are going to descend upon them, subhanAllah. In the previous surah, we were asked to reflect on the sky, and it's a different kind of reflection now. We were told, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ Didn't they look to the sky how it was elevated? And now on that day, when you look at that sky, the angels are descending. You know, one last thing about this, the, you know, the, them loving inherited, inherited wealth and them saving it on the earth for them. Allah says about Himself, Inna nahnu ardu wa man alayha, wa We are the ones in fact who are going to inherit the earth. Allah says about Himself, He will be the one to inherit the earth. So you think you're inheriting the earth, you think your children are inheriting the earth from you, your house, your assets, your property, your car, who's in the end going to inherit the entire earth? It is Allah Azza wa Jalla. So, وَنَحْئِنَّا نَحْنُ نَنِثُ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ عَلَيْهَا Then he says, سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَجِيءَ يَوْبَ إِذِمْ بِجَهَنَّمَ On that day then, hellfire, Jahannam will be brought forward. According to some Mufassirun and linguists, Jahannam comes from the Arabic word Jahnam, which means torture chamber. Okay? So this torture chamber will be brought forth, dragged forward with chains as we learned. Right? It's going to be brought forward before them, and then in the same ayah, Allah says, يَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ Because these are two lazim and malzum. These are things that are going to happen immediately. So it's not even given the separation of an ayah. يَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ فَأَنَّا وَأَنَّا لَهُ الدِّكْرَةِ On that day, the human being will remember thoroughly. You know, the word يَتَذَكَّرُ in sarf is completely spelled. And you can have idgham in it, يَذَّكَّرُ Like, أَوْ يَذَّكَّرُ فَتَنْفَعُهُ الدِّكْرَةِ Right? 
In the previous surahs we found, the messenger is told constantly, remind, 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 remind. And the, the, the disbelievers, they refuse to remember. Even remember a little bit. Yet dhakkaru. It's when there's a dram, it's a little less. Even just do a little bit of remembrance, nothing. But here now, yata dhakkarul insan, the human being will make an effort to remember everything completely. And this, what Allah Azza wa is highlighting here is a contrast. In the previous surahs, the messenger is saying, remember, remember, remember. And do they remember? No. When the hellfire is brought forward, now they themselves are making a thorough effort to remember every last detail. Yata dhakkarul insan. And what's the benefit of reminder at that point? What, what will that reminder do now? So at that point, them, themselves remembering and them being reminded has no benefit whatsoever. You know, in previous surahs we learned, عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا أَحْضَرَتْ عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ وَأَخْرَتْ Every person will know on that day what it has to present for itself. Every person will know what it sent forward, what it left behind. Profound statements about what, what they know. Here they are making a, a conscious effort to remember all the things they used to do. يَتَذَكُّرُ الْإِنسَانِ وَأَنَّ لَهُ الذِّكْرَى and what is it that, they, that comes out of their mouth when they start remembering everything that they had done? Everything. They'll remember all of their deeds. So what are they going to say? Ya laytani, yaqulu, ya laytani. He says, and yaqul, yadullu anul istibra. He says over and over again. What does he say? Ya laytani, oh what destruction has fallen upon me. Oh my God, what have I done to myself? These are my modern contemporary ways of helping you understand what ya laytani, mean. ya laytani means. Old English would say, woe is me. But we don't understand what was me anymore. Nobody uses that anymore, right? What have I done to myself? How, how, did, how, how, how did this happen to myself? I've destroyed myself. And these people are crying over and over again. Then what do they say? Something profound. قَدَّمْتُ hayati. If only, if only, I had invested in the future of my life. قَدَّمْتُ I had sent forward, I had sent savings ahead so I can use them later for my life. What are they calling their life? Their life, real life is in Jannah. I wish I invested for my life. And when they were eating the wealth of the orphan, when, when they were not encouraging to give charity, when they were eating the, the inherited wealth altogether, when they loved wealth, wasn't it for their life? But now they realize that wasn't life. This is, وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ This is real life. لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُوا Had they only known. So now he's saying, if I only invested for my life. And these people of dunya, when you invest for akhirah, you know what they tell you? Yeah, I know you gave a lot of charity or you're doing a lot of spending a lot of time for the sake of Allah. You should invest for your future. What they mean by that is for your dunya. And you say, yeah, I'm investing for my future because that's your real future. Right? And then when they get to that future, they say, I wish I invested for my life. How Allah, how Allah changes perspectives. But at that, at that point, it's too late. And you know, this is why in the previous surah, even we learned, لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرِ You're not there to enforce anything on them. You're not there to enforce anything. They have to remember for themselves. And if they don't, this is what's ahead of them. So we find in Safat al-Tafasir, أَن يَقُولُ نَادِمًا مُتَحَسِّرًا يَا لَيْتَنِي قَدِّمْتُ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا يَنْفَعْنِي فِي الْآخِرَةِ لِحَيَاتِيَ الْبَاقِيَةِ He says, he will say out of humiliation and just this deeply felt regret, if only I had, I had sent forward and acted with righteous deeds that would have benefited me in my hereafter, my real life that is to remain. فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لا يعذب عذابه أحد أي ففي ذلك اليوم ليس أحد أشد عذابا أشد عذابا من من تعذيب الله من عصاه سبحان الله. he says uh, in the tafsir we find a shaukani commenting first I'll translate then on that day there will not be anyone to torture anyone the way Allah is going to not anyone will be torturing his the likes of his torture لا يعذب عذابه أحد not the likes of his torture and so the commentary is, on that day there's not going to be anyone who can imagine a more intense punishment than the one Allah has prepared for the one who disobeyed him. What were the acts of disobedience in this surah? Just take a recall. Just look at the things Allah said are, you think you should be honored, what are the things you do wrong? The, the complaints Allah had waged against these people. And before tughiyan, rebellion, rebellion and causing fasad on the earth. Then he says, وَلَا يُوثِقُ وَثَاقَهُ أَحَدْ you know, if you're being punished and tortured, maybe there's a hope you'll escape and run away. Right? There's, there's that at least in this world. 
that if there's a bad prison or somebody's going to torture you or is hurting you, maybe there's going to be a window of opportunity where they'll leave the rope or the, the handcuffs loose a little bit and you might run away. Allah says, وَلَا يُوثِقُوا وَثَاقَهُ أَحَدٌ And nobody will tie the, the likes of his tying. Meaning the way he's going to bond you and wathaq in Arabic, like it's used in Surah Muhammad, فَشَدُّ الْوَثَاقُ When you capture the criminals, tie them tight. Hold them tight, meaning these captives of war. So there's no chance of escape. Allah says, no, nobody's going to bond them like Allah is going to bond them. Nobody's going to bond them like that, subhanAllah. So this was the case of the criminals. We're reaching the end of the surah now. And there's a profound shift. It is as though, and this taghir, this, this, and this change, and this iltifat, this transition, that takes place in the surahs illustrates many things. What it illustrates here is in the previous ayat, we were talking about the rebellious. But it is as though these rebellious are beyond hope. They shouldn't even be talked to anymore. Like Allah was addressing them, and they're so hopeless, He turns away from them to the one that He has hope in. The one that He expects from now. Because this is a lost case. So they shouldn't even be talked to. In Urdu you say, Muni lagna. Right? You don't even address them. You don't even face them. So Allah faces away from them. He turns away from them. And He starts talking to this one, each individual person. He says, Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutma'inna." Oh, tranquil, or he, he says, hey, tranquil, or, or calm down and relaxed person. I'm not going to translate soul, because that's a bit of a bit fuzzy thing in English. But anyway, a lot of translations do say soul. But this nafs is something more, right? This, oh, hey, you nafs that has now become tranquil and calm. You know where this talk, talk is taking place? It's taking place in Jannah. And you know, ya yeah in Arabic is used when you talk to someone. Not when you talk about someone, third person. When you talk to someone, meaning second person. Allah is forcing the reciter of Qur'an to imagine his or herself being addressed by Allah in this ayah. He is forcing us to imagine ourselves in Jannah when Allah is talking to us, subhanAllah. When He says, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna Hey, satis- O oh, you satisfied soul. O oh, satisfied person. Mutma'inna, itma'inan in Arabic means to be completely tranquil. How are you tranquil? And by the way, this surah was about a person who wasn't tranquil. He was only happy when he had wealth. And as soon as it went away, he was disturbed. And he said, my Lord has humiliated me. But the real slave of Allah, this person, he, he didn't let his nafs get taken away by empty desires. So Allah mentions it in another place, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى the one, who feared, the, the one who feared standing before his Lord, and he prevented the nafs from vain, from vanities, from empty desires, right? So this person is being, Allah is addressing him now, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Addressing them with these beautiful words, tranquil nafs, oh calm, satisfied nafs. This in and of itself illustrates one of the greatest gifts of paradise is itmi'nan. It's this calmness, it's this relaxation. Because this is not something we can ever have in this dunya. If you are ever relaxed in this dunya, it's probably 10 seconds. Or like 5 minutes, where you say, oh, and then something comes in your mind. Oh, I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I have to do this. I have to do that. Oh my God, I forgot about that. Something keeps coming up. And no matter what you have in this dunya, there's always something you don't have. Right? Always. Always. There's something more. There's something more. Nobody's satisfied. Allah says about this person, he's finally satisfied. Like there's no urge to get any more. There's no urge. There's no, I wish I had that. It's already there. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ before I go any further, I'd like to connect these, the beginning of the surah to the end so we appreciate something very powerful. We spoke in the beginning about the four oaths that Allah Azza wa took, and we talked about the various tafsir and their commentary on wal fajr, wal ayal in ashr, wal shafi'i wal watr, wal layl idha yas. We find something really beautiful commented upon by Muhammad al Sha'ara, Mutawalli al Sha'arawi rahimahullah. Really beautiful. He says those four oaths are also particularly special for the tranquil self. The person who reaches this tranquility is a real servant of Allah, slave of Allah. And what are the most blessed acts of slavery to Allah? Number one, it's the Fajr prayer, right? Abandoning your sleep. Then the slave of Allah takes most advantage of what times? The last 10 of Ramadan, the first 10 of the Hijjah, right? Walayal and Ashr. Then was Shafi wal Watr, which were the, the, the odd and the even nights of those times as it was interpreted. Some even interpreted it as the odd prayers and the even prayers. The even and the odd rather, right? 
And then when Layli Ida Yasr, the night as it's about to disappear. When the night is about to disappear is the is the time to wrap up your Qiyam al Layl. Right? Which is the, again the act of closeness to Allah Azza wa And also the time to finish your suhoor so you can what? Fast. So the, the acts of closest worship to Allah Azza wa are those times that are illustrated or, or those uh, what, what's alluded to in the opening oaths. And the one who was committed to those oaths, how is Allah addressing that person at the end? Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutma'inna. Now, what has satisfied this nafs? What has satisfied this nafs? Everybody else was running after stuff. What is the first and most important gift Allah gives this nafs? Irji'i ila rabbiki. Return to your master. Return to your master. That's the, that's the thing that was dissatisfying this nafs. That nothing else satisfied this person in their heart. Just remembering Allah satisfied them. And now Allah gives them satisfaction beyond even remembering Allah. Return to Allah. In this there is a profound reality in the life of a Muslim who makes tawbah. Or in the life of anyone who accepts this deen. When you return to Allah Azza wa Jal, you face a lot of difficulty. Whether you are a Muslim who is in sin. And they decide they want to change their life and they want to become obedient to Allah. Or you are a non-Muslim who came into a con- to contact with the teachings of this deen and accepted this deen. As soon as you become serious about this deen, and you're serious about returning to your master, and really living like you're a slave, then you face a lot of problems. Your family gets in the way, your friends get in the way, your own old habits get in the way, your society gets in the way. Everything around you gets in the way. Maybe even the way you used to earn your money wasn't halal. So you have to lose your money too. Maybe you have to lose your business too. You definitely lose your friends. You always, you, you suffer, the, the relationships and family suffer. The marital relationship can suffer. The relationship with your kids or your parents can suffer. All these problems because you did what? Return to Allah. And all of these things are connected with being dissatisfied in life, aren't they? But when you are cut off from all of these things, and you return only to Allah, you find a tranquility you never found before. You know, I've, I've met brothers before whose life was all about partying. They would go to clubs and drugs. Everything that would, they would think would bring them pleasure in life, they tried. They tried it. They did it. And then Allah brought them to the deen. And they said, man, after you return to Allah, that is a high I've never felt. Nothing compares. Nothing compares. There is no, you know, at the end of any of these activities where you try to please yourself or you indulge in these sorts of things, right? This Hellenistic, you know, lifestyle where you just live for pleasure. At the end of all of that, they are so, like, these are the people that commit suicides and stuff. Like, they can't, they're never satisfied. They're never done. They can't get enough. And they think it's going to just bring them to an end. But they become enslaved to their own habits. Right? They're not even, they don't even feel free. They say things like, I can't quit. What do you mean you can't quit? Like somebody has a, it's a master over them telling them you can't quit. And that's how bad it's gotten for them. So you become free from all of that and finally you become satisfied. So irji'i ila rabbik. Radiyatan mardiyah. Two adjectives that are so incredibly beautiful. One, pleased. Pleased with who? With Allah. Why is that important? In this surah, did Allah speak about the one who's not pleased with Allah? The one who re- first who rebels against Allah and causes corruption? Then the one who Allah, when He pro- takes the sum risk and calculates it? He becomes displeased with Allah. Now this nafs, because he's truly returned to Allah, he's just happy, just content with Allah. The world can go left to right, the sun can rise from the, from the west too. He'll still be content with Allah. This, this slave of Allah. Then even more mardiyya, ism maf'ul. And you are pleased with, meaning your Lord is pleased with you too. You are pleased with Allah, and Allah is pleased with you. Return, you are so happy with me, and I am so happy with you. Allah is saying, subhanAllah ta'ala to this. What an amazing gift. But that's not the only gift. He gives another gift after this. He says, فَدْخُلِي fi ibadi." Enter then in the midst of my slaves. You know, the first gift was in the company of who? Allah Himself. Return to your Lord. The second gift is the company of the other slaves of Allah. You know, this believer read about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He read about Adam alayhi salam. He read about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. And he read about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He read about these people and he said, man, I want to meet them so bad. And what does Allah say after he lets him meet himself? He says, فَدْخُلِي فِي Enter the company of myself. Join. You're part of this group. You can go in. There's no exclusive access. There's no yellow tape, no security guard on the doors. That you, no, no access here. This is first class only. Prophets and messengers only. Nope. فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي And in comparison to that, what is last? What's the last thing he mentions? فَدْخُلِي 
Jannati, enter my Jannah. The, in comparison to these gifts, Allah put Jannah last, subhanAllah. <laughs> now, the last comment about this Jannah. Allah didn't say, Wadkhulil Jannah, enter paradise. He says, Jannati, enter my paradise, enter my Jannah. Meaning, Allah is, you know, almost as though Allah Azza wa Jal wants to show him what special arrangements in Jannah He has made for this one individual person. He's not even talking to the Ummah at large. This address is individual. Fadkhuli, irji'i, wadkhuli. Individual, individual, individual. Allah individually addresses the person who enters Jannah and says, Come, let me show you my Jannah that I've given to you. Wadkhuli Jannati, enter my Jannah. SubhanAllah. You know, it's one thing to say, enter your Jannah. But Allah says, enter my Jannah. SubhanAllah. What a difference. What a difference that makes. SubhanAllah. So at the end, this intifat, I want to again reiterate before I close. This transition illustrates that Allah is forcing us. He's forcing us. When you hear these words, these are second person. Who's talking? Allah. Who's listening? You and I. He's forcing us to picture ourselves in that paradise. He's forcing us to picture ourselves in that paradise. May Allah Azza wa make us these slaves of Allah that reach tranquility in this life. May Allah Azza wa let us take advantage of the profound days and the acts of worship that He highlighted in the beginning of this surah. May Allah Azza wa forgive the shortcomings we have in our ibadat, the way our mind wanders in the salawat, the way we, we skip our prayers because of sleep and laziness, the way we waste our nights in, you know, in, in entertaining ourselves or wasting time. May Allah Azza wa protect us from, from all of that and make us amongst His beloved slaves that enter into His company, into the company of His beloved slaves and into His, his special paradise. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.